cloud. My name is Jerry Gordon. I'm a senior editor at the New English Review. And uh, this is the eighth SITREP discussion with retired Army Brigadier General John Adams. And John, before we begin, would you give us the customary prayers for both Israel and uh, the IDF? Thank you for the opportunity to join you today, Jerry. It's an honor. Uh, the IDF is fighting for all of us. Let us ask God's blessing on them uh, as they as they fight for all of us, as they defend Israel against evil, against Hamas, against Hezbollah, against Iran. Let us keep them in our prayers and let us know that God is with them uh, as they do God's uh, blessings. Uh, let us also keep our minds and prayers on Israel and on the Jewish people at this very critical time in history. Thank you. Let's start off with the obvious activities that are going on these days, which are disturbing. Did the Biden administration effectively abandon Israel by not vetoing the Algerian-sponsored Ramadan ceasefire at the UN Security Council resolution? Yes, I think that that failure to veto that resolution and just to let it pass, basically, without taking a stand on it, is a betrayal of not only Israel, but of our own interests in the region. The United States is, has always stood with Israel in the past, and God willing will continue to stand with Israel in the future. But this was a show of weakness, and uh, the message to Israel is maybe we're not with you as much as you think we are. Um, and it's also a betrayal of American interests. Uh, the American people stand with Israel. Uh, poll after poll shows that. Uh, Israel is not alone. Um, Israel is a country that uh, was founded in adversity, uh, has built itself uh, through great efforts, uh, economically, uh, culturally, militarily. Um, they have done everything they can do to be a great ally to the United States. And they must know, and we must let them know that we stand with them in this really critical time. It's interesting to note that Israel has always had a bipartisan support in our Congress with both Democrats and Republicans standing up to proclaim that we stand with Israel, that we, the United States, will always have Israel's back diplomatically and militarily. So this is really unique in uh, the history of our relationship between the U.S. and Israel. This is really unique in the sense that we have a, a government which has decided to send a, a very confusing and, and unusual message to our allies in the Middle East. And we're being watched. The U.S. actions are watched. Um, and we have uh, people who don't wish Israel well commenting that Israel is now alone, and it's not. The American people overwhelmingly support Israel, and it's time for our, our own government to back the American people as well as Israel in supporting both diplomatically and militarily Israel at this critical time. Was Prime Minister Netanyahu justified in pulling the plug, so to speak, on a trip of senior Israeli defense and security officials to D.C. to confer on the so-called Gaza war strategy? Yes, it was. he was justified in doing that. And he, like the U.S., with the failure to... Uh, uh, to uh, failure to um, veto the Security Council resolution, Prime Minister Netanyahu sends a message to the U.S. that that's not acceptable. And so he canceled the visit, the scheduled visit of two very senior Israeli officials to Washington to sit at the lap of President Biden and his, his advisors and they, they, so that they can tell him how best to fight their war. The the unusual vision of United States summoning, and that's what it was, it was a summons, a summoning an ally fighting a war on its own border 
for its own survival. And oh, by the way, fighting for us too, the unusual uh, effort to summon the Israelis to Washington was just flew in the face of common sense. It's reported now that uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu will uh, send a delegation after all sometime next week. But I think he made his point. Uh, this is unacceptable for the U.S. to stand back from Israel right now. They're at war for their survival. So I think he was justified in pulling the delegation this week. So what was behind the message that Vice President Harris conveyed to Netanyahu when she said if the IDF entered Rafa, it would have consequences? What does that tell the world audience? I think I think the U.S. She was a very poor uh, representative to convey that message. Uh, Vice President Harris has no military background, no credibility as a strategist or as a military person in any way. There, I think, I think it's more domestic U.S. politics to try to give Vice President Harris uh, a stronger role uh, to to let her have the chance to play the bad guy. Uh, and look strong uh, because her polling is so weak as we approach the general election. Um, so she's a poser. Um, and Israelis know it. Everybody that knows Vice President Harris knows that she's a poser uh, in any case. And so when she makes a statement that has a threat like that, um, serious observers go, first of all, why is she the one conveying this message? Um, unless it's just it's just a convenient uh, American domestic politics. But the message too, that Israel is not doing what they need to do to protect human life. This is the core, one of the core values of the IDF is to protect human life. Uh, the IDF has fought this war as well as it could be fought. Uh, and numerous knowledgeable international observers who understand war, understand conflict, understand uh, understand terrorism, uh, have, have made the comment that no other country would fight this war as cleanly as the Israeli Defense Forces have. So everyone from John Spencer uh, in the United States, who's a noted expert on warfare, uh, to the U.S. government's own advisors who are puzzled by this comment um, are uh, really, it's an amazing thing that the U.S. would warn Israel about this and not understand this war was not brought by Israel. This war was brought by the depredations of Hamas who killed more than a thousand Israelis on October 7th. This war is, uh, the, Hamas is the evil here. The IDF is just doing its best to get through it. Curious to me that uh, this past week, the front page of the venerable British publication, The Economist, has a picture of an Israeli flag blowing in sandstorm winds, and the title of the piece is Israel Alone, with a, not an exclamation mark, but with a period. Well, it's the, a sad commentary. Yes. on what's going on right now. It is at odds with certainly the American people's support for Israel. It is not alone. Um, but it's also, it, it goes back to the attitude of the world elites toward Israel since the founding of Israel in 1948. Uh, it was given little chance to survive. Uh, in fact, they realized the odds were long, but they fought anyway. So in, a, in an interesting way, in 1948, in 1956, in the Suez Crisis, in 1967, in the Six-Day War, in 1973, in the Yom Kippur War, Israel's found itself, it, by the definition imposed by the world's media, alone. Once again, they're alone. And I, I think that what we should do is, one, take counsel of what uh, they mean by that, uh, and they look at the U.S. public, they look at people of conscience all over the world who support Israel, who are, are revolted by what happened on October 7th and understand why Israel is fighting against this evil. 
Israel's not alone. Uh, Israel is being castigated by uh, world media elites and some in the government, but it's not alone. There are, there's a majority in the United States of the people who support it, and a, a fair number of countries who understand what's at stake here. Israel is fighting not just for itself, but for civilization. Israel is not alone. In actual fact, has the U.S. slowed down any deliveries of weapons as an aside to put pressure on Israel and the IDF? In By all accounts, weapon. both from the IDF, which is the recipient of weapons delivery, and continues to be the recipient for weapons delivery, uh, and the U.S. observers, uh, lower-level observers, uh, the weapons shipments continue to arrive in, in Israel, and they are, there's no indication that there's going to be any stoppage of that. So there is a disconnect between these threats to curtail weapons deliveries and what is going on as we speak. Um, let us hope that they continue. Defense Minister Gallant and one other individual, Ron Dermer, were in Washington when this break came. And the question arises is, how realistic were, would be the U.S. national security echelon in coming up with their version of an attack in Rafa? Simply stated, where is the U.S. credibility to advise Israel on how to conduct its own military affairs? I think it's low. Um, I th I'm sure we have observers. Uh, we know we have observers with the IDF. Hopefully they're learning some lessons in how the IDF conducts the operations well. But I don't think that the observers are telling the Israelis how to conduct this operation. Nor do I think that the State Department of the United States or the non-military officials who likely would meet with uh, with Ron Dermer and with Hanekbi are, are going to have any serious military thoughts on how best to protect civilians during this war. In fact, the Israelis have, have accumulated a massive amount of experience and expertise since October 7th doing exactly that. The problem is Hamas. Hamas wants to use civilian shields. They, they like it when there are casualties. That's the way they fight. They're all about putting civilians in the front, in front of them. Uh, they're, they don't want to, they tell the, Hamas is telling the people in Gaza, the civilians in Gaza, not to evacuate, to stay home, to get in the way of, of Israeli uh, operations. Hamas is the problem. They are the ones who want to kill civilians and they're killing them. They kill their own people. Um, so for the U.S. to pontificate about how best to protect civilians during a military operation, given our own lack of experience in this particular kind of warfare, uh, I think is, it, it just doesn't make sense. John Spencer uh, from the Institute of Study of War at West Point has said, and he's a retired Army major and he's a scholar, well-published scholar, as well as a soldier with decades of experience in fighting, uh, particularly against counterterrorism fighting, has said that there's this is a historic um, moment for Israel and it's the way it's conducted this operation. They're they're doing they're fighting a war that has never been fought in this to this ex extent, uh, and they're doing a tremendous job at protecting human life. What does the IDF experience, particularly in the operations at Shifra Hospital and the Hamad complex in Khan Union, reveal about not only the so-called resilience of Hamas and PIJ forces, but something that you and I know professionally is the importance of intelligence in refining combat operations. Well, it's interesting to note that the operations in Hamad in Khan Yunus and in uh, Al Shifa Hospital in northern Gaza both are intelligence led. Um, the a tremendous amount of intelligence has been gained over the past five months from interrogating Hamas terrorists, um, 
they've, they've learned a lot about how they fight, how they operate, and who they are. So when the IDF and Shabak, the uh, Israeli intelligence ser- counterintelligence service, went in together uh, in both those locations, uh, Shabak was leading and, and, and designated the targets. Uh, where, when, and who uh, were all intelligence-led. So it says a lot about how the IDF has mastered human intelligence in, throughout this operation. And they started off on the back foot, clearly. But they've learned a lot, and they've they've conducted this partic- these particular operations very well conducted. So it bodes well for uh, future operations uh, in Rafa that uh, their intelligence-led operations are being conducted so well. It also does say a lot about the resilience of Hamas. Um, they they were routed out of uh, Al Shifa Hospital back in I think it was November, early mm-hmm. November, and it was a fierce fight. And there was a lot of criticism. Oh, they're going into a hospital. Well, they're going into a hospital because that's where the fighters are. And it shows that Hamas is not afraid to use medical cover for its operations. It shows that Hamas knows uh, how to do that and how to pretend how to pretend that they're uh, actually doing uh, human, humanitarian work or medical work. Uh, and what they're really doing is they're just masquerading so that they can conduct these terrorist operations. Uh, without being attacked. Uh, so the IDF carefully, uh, they, they conducted interrogations well uh, to know what to look for and know, more importantly, specific individuals to look for when they went into Al-Shifa. And many of those individuals have either been captured or killed. Why have these uh, ceasefire hostages release and the exchange of Palestinians broken down under the auspices of Qatar. How neutral is Qatar? No, Qatar, Qatar is implicated. They're, they're hosting Hamas leadership uh, at every turn during the negotiations. They have uh, assisted Hamas in dissembling, uh, blocking initiatives, uh, covering Hamas uh, with their own diplomacy, their own uh, faithlessness. Qatar is 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 part of the Hamas problem, not a solution to it. And Qatar is really uh, treated. Uh, they're not. They're not. They're not impartial. Uh, it would be nice to think they were, but they're not. And the U.S. seems to be under some sort of spell when it comes to Qatar. I can think of some reasons why they might be, and and then hopefully we'll know at some point. But probably the biggest reason that their actions are suspect is that Qatar not only hosts Hamas, but hosts the the largest U.S. base in the Middle East, al Yadid Air Base, which is about 80 miles uh, northwest of Doha, the capital of Qatar. It's the largest air base. Uh, it is a critical air facility for U.S. operations in the region. And we just renewed their, we just renewed the lease with Qatar uh, about six months ago, not not long before October seventh. So we we have we're, our interests with Qatar are complicated. Not only do they uh, host Hamas, but they also host our the U.S. largest air base. And I think you know my personal thought is that we should call them on this, and we should not rely on them as an impartial. Uh, in these negotiations, every single time that the Israelis say, "Well, we, we can, we'll, we'll, we'll go along with the U.S. proposed negotiation position. We'll go along, and and we'll, we want to get the hostages back. That's our, that's our goal. That's a, a really uh, important goal for the IDF. One of, one of the most important things is the dual goal of getting the hostages back and, and destroying Hamas. But every time. Uh, the negotiations go uh, hard, hard nose to the wall. Um, Hamas says no, and they want they want nothing more than what they would call complete victory, which is Israeli de- retreat or de- withdrawal from Gaza, and the opportunity for Hamas to continue to exist and not just exist, but take over the leadership of the population of Gaza. And the land, the 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 land of Gaza. So, the, and th- those are not those are really not negotiable after October seventh. 
But the negotiations are not stalled and not not blocked by Israel. They're blocked by Hamas with the with the uh, complicit participation of Qatar, which has shown itself to be a faithless negotiator. So then why does the U.S. and uh, the Atlantic Alliance consider Qatar to be the most significant non-NATO ally? Well, I think the most important reason is because of Al Udeed Air Base. Um, and it's a massive facility. And I've, I've, I've spent days on Al Udeed Air Base on the runways. Um, it's huge. Uh, it's multi-billion dollar facility and it, it's constantly being updated and renewed. So it's a tremendous investment by the United States government. But I think the other reason is because the United States needs to have a fig leaf of, of uh, control or faith or they need that we need to find uh, uh, some impartial negotiator and unfortunately we've chosen the wrong one uh, qatar is not an impartial negotiator it's not somebody that we can rely upon to press hamas in fact they're hosting Hamas. they're giving hamas credibility so i, I think i think it's misplaced uh, i think we are i think we're making not only a strategic and diplomatic mistake but we're betraying our own values and interests when we rely on qatar doesn't uh, Qatar share the same ideological underpinnings of the Muslim Brotherhood and Hamas? They have been, Qatar has been a sponsor of the Muslim Brotherhood for a, gen, for a generation. Um, they, they, they don't advertise it as, 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 they don't advertise it as much, but if you look at their actions diplomatically and uh, politically, They've always been a supporter of Muslim Brotherhood, and they continue to, which is why uh, they're hosting Hamas leadership. Hamas leadership feels very comfortable in Qatar. I might say that Hamas leadership lives like well-funded billionaires in yes. Qatar. Well, it's a pretty good life. Doha is a very wealthy city. Right. It's on a par with any of the other Middle Eastern or, or Gulf states. It's... Earlier, you mentioned uh, John Spencer, who's one of the few Western experienced military strategists and observers. The other is obviously Colonel Richard E. Kemp, who served as the British commander forces uh, in Afghanistan and who is demonstrably a good friend of Israel. But he held a rather interesting interview with Prime Minister Netanyahu talking about historical uh, precedents for what's going on there. He mentioned specifically the Battle of Manila that occurred in the waning phases of World War II with horrendous civilian casualties there. But he also said, as you indicated earlier, that the IDF strategy is historic because who else but Israel would communicate with civilians saying we're coming stand aside, we'll even knock on your roof with something, we'll even send you uh, text messages saying it's about time for you to move. Uh, Spencer made the telling point that heretofore success in military operations had two factors, surprise and violence. This essentially <laughs> evades those principles, and yet Israel seems to be progressing towards its ultimate objective of destroying what it identifies as the remaining fighting units of Hamas, particularly in Rafa. So where do we go from this vantage point in terms of trying to convince the world that what Israel is doing is not only historic, but also caring for civilians, something that hasn't happened even during the Iraq war. The way Israel fights is to try to um, respect human life. Um, they are going to accomplish the mission, but they're going to do with the minimum casualties and also the minimum amount of damage to the infrastructure. 
it's impossible to not damage infrastructure in war. It's impossible to not have collateral damage. Uh, but Israel takes great care to avoid both of those. Uh, it's part of their spirit of the IDF, which is their code, the code uh, under which they operate and train. Um, it's biblical. Um, the IDF is operating on spiritual and biblical principles. And that's what the code of the IDF is all about. Um, that's why they are so dedicated to preserving human life wherever possible. But if you're fighting an enemy like Hamas, or Hezbollah for that matter, or Iran, all of which are radical Islamic enemies, and they fight according to Sharia principles, you're going to be fighting an enemy that doesn't care about human life, who not only don't care about their own lives, but they don't care about the people who are between them and their target. So it's a it's a very unusual uh, relationship uh, in the on the battlefield. On the one hand, you've got the IDF, which operates according to uh, humanitarian principles. On the other hand, you've got an enemy like Hamas, which operates on the court according to the principle of we want to kill people. We want to kill not just the enemy, we want to kill the people around the enemy. In fact, we don't just want to kill the enemy, we want to kill their, their population. Uh, Hamas is dedicated not just to uh, killing IDF soldiers, but to killing Jews, um, killing Israelis and Jews just because they're Israelis and Jews. And that is that is absolutely opposite to this the, the way the IDF fights. The IDF wants to preserve human life whenever possible, which doesn't mean they're just going to sit out and fold up on the battlefield. No, they're going to fight hard and fight till victory, but they're going to try to do it in a way that preserves human life. Harkening back to your comments earlier, there was a rather intriguing Harvard CPS Harris poll taken in late February that indicated that well over 67%, two thirds of Americans support Israel. Yes, there were differential uh, opinions within a certain age groups, the uh, kids in the Gen Z generation, the 18 and 24 gap, don't want to have much to do with it. Um, people in middle age groups are a little less, but still very supportive of Israel. And when, when it gets to the level of you and I, it's virtually all, or about 90 plus percent in that age cohort. And does that also throw water on the international media, not unlike the reference we had just a few minutes ago to The Economist, about where Americans stand with their ally Israel? Well, I think what you're seeing is the, the, the uh, simple way to explain why young people are less supportive of this war than older people are is because older people are more educated and more experienced they understand what's going on and and we we have a greater stake just to, because we've been on this planet a longer time I, I, that's a simple explanation but it's also there's also some truth to the fact that this is not the first time in in this case israel has been under attack so those of us who've been around a while have been here before. Uh, and those of us who have a, any kind of memory of, let's say, the, the Yom Kippur War, realize this is a very similar situation. Yom right. Kippur War was, there were still the U.S., most of the U.S. people supported Israel during the Yom Kippur War did too, but there was a tremendous distinction between people who um, are in the elites and the media and the professional um, members of certain pr professions uh, support for Israel and, and people who have more at stake, let's say. The military was supportive of Israel in 1973. Um, some other some other parts of our government were not. And, it, and it, I think that's kind of reflected today, too. You see a lot of media and government elites uh, being very wary of speaking out in favor of Israel and not supporting it. And it's complicated by the fact that um, 
yes, there, there was an interview yesterday, for example, with uh, a very famous American uh, academic, Alan Dershowitz, who has been a strong supporter of Israel through his life. He's also been a strong supporter of the Democratic Party. Uh, he said he said in the interview, I've voted Democratic since 1960 with John Kennedy. Um, he was old enough to do that. Uh, I was not, but I remember that. Uh, and I, I I remember, and I think and there's, there's something to say for that. He said, now, I'm not so sure. I'm, I'm starting to doubt my allegiance to the Democratic Party because I don't know what they're representing. I don't, I, when I see senior Democratic Party officials attacking Israel or not supporting Israel, I guess there's a difference between attacking it and not supporting it, but certainly not supporting it. Uh, I wonder about where my allegiance should be. And this is this is a very lifelong Democrat who says this. And what he's what he's talking about really is that support for Israel is unfortunately it's becoming a partisan issue uh, by the actions of some members of the Democratic Party. Perhaps they're more concerned about the election this year. I I, I imagine they are. Uh, we already know that there's a tremendous uh, outcry in Michigan and Minnesota, where there's a large Muslim population. And I think the Democrats are perhaps logically concerned about uh, their support in uh, the states of Michigan and Minnesota. But this is a moral issue. It's not a it's not a partisan issue. It's a moral issue. And Dershowitz recognizes that. And other Americans recognize that. This is something that U.S. has been behind Israel uh, and supportive of Israel since its founding, um, and now more than ever needs to be because of the threat to the, the Israelis and the Jewish people uh, that's going on right now. So if, if Israel ever needed American support and needed American leadership support, it's now. Uh, it's sad to say that it's, a, it's becoming a partisan issue. Let's go talk about other theaters of action in the Middle East, and in particular, the Iran-backed Houthi rebels in Yemen, appear to have gained control over the international maritime choke point in the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden. This despite the intervention of a U.S.-U.K.-led international naval and air force contingent that uh, tries to engage in attacks on facilities in Yemen proper. Why is this strategy not deterring Iran's, Iran's proxies, not only in Yemen, but elsewhere in the Middle East, whether it's in Syria or in Iraq, and certainly with regard to Hezbollah in Lebanon? It's, it's failing because the US and the coalition, and it's a great idea to organize the coalition, no question, and it's a great idea to uh, place American naval uh, power in this in the region so that they can they can actually combat um, in this case the Houthis. But unless you unless you have overwhelming um, force to stop the Houthis, they're gonna they're not gonna stop. Um, we can we can continue to attack. The Houthis uh, installations and troops, and we can do we can re respond, but the response isn't going to stop it. The only thing that's going to stop it is this overwhelming force. Non-proportional is the magical word. If we have proportion, if we just continue to throw rocks back and forth across the wall, which is sort of what we're doing, they're going to continue to throw rocks uh, because there's no incentive for them to stop. Uh, there's no deterrence effect. Deterrence depends upon disproportionate force. And we have not done that. We, the United States, nor the coalition have done that. The only way to solve this problem is to cut off their source, and that would be Iran. Iran is motivating and supplying uh, the Houthis. They're, so they're motivating and supplying um, the Hezbollah in Lebanon. Uh, they're doing, they, they, they're motivated and supplied uh, Hamas. Um, I think it's a little bit harder to get weapons to a mosque now than it was, let's say, six months ago. But that's how they got all the weapons is from not even not just Iran, but Iran's proxies. 
Um, and they also send the IRGC, the Iranian Republican Guard Force, Guard Corps, uh, to all over the region to be the cadre for um, for efforts against Israel and against the United States. And we've done very little to um, to attack them directly. We need to attack Iran. That's the problem that we're missing. You know, Iran is the, the source of the, the unrest and the instability. Um, they provide the weapons, equipment, and training for their proxies. Uh, they send their own people. The IRGC are Iranians, by the way. Um, they, they send their own IRGC to, as cadre. And we've done very little, if anything, uh, to hurt Iran. Until we do that, we're not going to have the effect that we want, which is to stop the actions, stop the attacks. A recent government poll, ironically, in Iran, revealed that nearly two-thirds of the respondent wanted a change to a secular government. They basically wanted the mullahs and the ayatollahs to disappear for all intents and purposes. And this comes at the background of reports by the Washington-based Institute for Science and International Security, led by a former UN uh, nuclear weapons inspector, David Albright, suggesting that Iran's within weeks uh, of essentially being able to weaponize its stock of enriched uranium to the point of perhaps having anywhere between six to 12 weapons that it could be used. The um, question about Iran is also raised in a series of Jerusalem Report articles by an acclaimed Israeli Middle East expert, Mordecai Ketter. Ketter puts his finger on things that are occurring in Iran that the U.S. and its allies are missing out in terms of regime change. He points out the... Uh, Azerbaijanis, who are called in, in Lebanon, the Awaz in the southwest, which basically that province has all the oil. That's a Sunni group. Another Sunni group in the southeast are the valiant blocks who are fighting against the Pakistanis, against the Chinese, and against Iran in the southeast, and others. And the question is, why isn't the West adopting what Winston Churchill did during the early phases of World War II, setting up a special ops executive to essentially launch a concerted program fostering regime change in a country that's crying out for freedom, that is impoverished by the Ayatollahs? Take a look at the drop in the Iranian income and its currency at its lowest point in decades at this point in time. That's the issue. Why isn't the West standing up and realizing that it's in a state of never-ending war with Iran? I, you ask an obvious question, why aren't we doing something? And why isn't, why, if, if, we, if we do have uh, allies in the West, and I some countries seem more proposed, more more disposed to supporting us than others. The Brits, for example. Why don't we? Why don't we take advantage of this huge vulnerability that Iran has? Um, and and uh, again, I if we look at covert operations, our Central Intelligence Agency may or may not be conducting. We're not going to know, uh, or shouldn't know, until uh, they bear fruit. But uh, it doesn't. From from the outside, it appears that we're not doing we're not taking advantage of this vulnerability to the extent that we could, and and I think it's worthwhile speculating on why that might be. Um, you know, our the current administration's commitment to the uh, JCPOA, which was the uh, the nuclear deal, uh, may be overriding uh, conditions that. You know, beg, beg common sense to hey, let's undermine Iran. Let's not help them. Let's not let's not try, let's not coddle and mollify them. Let's let's attack them. We don't we're, we don't seem to be doing that. 
the other thing that I think may be play, at play here is the desire of uh, this particular administration for the magical two-state solution, which not not that the Iran's, Iranians would ever support that, but to essentially go into open combat with Iran right now would probably shelve the two-state solution for the foreseeable future. And that may be one of the things that they that the current administration wants to protect. And it's more to the point now, because if, if there's going to be a, a grand bargain in the Middle East, which has been discussed in, in the press by uh, such as Thomas Friedman, uh, and certainly Alan Blinken, our, the current Secretary, Secretary of State, uh, has talked about this at length. Uh, if there's going to be a, a grand bargain between now and the election, we don't have much time. So things that would sort of blow up uh, the Middle East right now would be uh, would be counter to that. I think it's un it still doesn't make sense to me that we're not taking advantage of this obvious opportunity to destabilize the Iranian government. Let's go vector to another locale, which is the. Uh... Russian war with the Ukraine, but in particular, the recent event in Moscow of an attack by an alleged team of ISIS-K operatives from, of all places, Tajikistan, attacking a rock concert, killing over 140 men, women, and children. And this it follows almost on the heels of the sixth presidential election victory of President Putin. Some contend this might be a possible false flag operation trying to connect the attack with the war in Ukraine. This is despite U.S. intelligence warnings to the Russian that such an attack had been threatened. What does it tell us about President Putin's vulnerability in his belligerent actions? towards the West, and obviously pred predations, essentially, to his own people and against the Ukrainians. Well, it's an understatement to state that Vladimir Putin is a bad actor, uh, that we can't rely on him at all, um, neither as an actor or as a, a diplomatic figure. He's always going to dissemble because that's how he operates. Uh, there's not going to be any way to rely upon what here his government says. So it's completely it completely lacks any credibility. Um, is it a false flag operation? It could be. Uh, he's done things like that before, and he he will do anything to um, continue to protect his own regime. Um, and if accusing this action, uh, or if, if staging this action is a way of distracting from his own problems, um, he would do that. So it's not it's not at all um, unlikely that it is a false flag, false flag operation. However, there are other actors, uh, specifically the ISIS. Uh, they're they'll they'll attack him. They they have a, a long standing uh, hatred and. Uh, enmity with the uh, Russian government, just like they have with everybody. They're, they're Islamic fundamentalist terrorists. So I don't think we know enough about where they're coming from, but I think anything that uh, that Putin says is, should be it should be discredited. Uh, what's the most likely, I think, is they probably are they probably are terrorists. There may be some connection between Russian uh, internal security services and, and ISIS, I find it difficult that they would want to kill more than 140 people in the center of Moscow, but it's not an, it's not impossible. Uh, so I think skepticism is the, is the word uh, when it comes to evaluating who is behind uh, this particular massacre. Finally, turning to Ukraine itself, despite Russian onslaughts of missile attacks and the lacks of U.S. delivery of weapons, it has been furthering its own capabilities in long-range air and naval drone actions against Russian oil refineries 
and against the Black Sea fleet of Russia. Um, what does it tell us about the status of the conflict in its third year? And what does it tell us in particular about a shift in the future war scenarios of AI-driven drone warfare? Well, I think it says a couple of things. The most important, it says that Ukraine continues to show um, its strength in um, innovation and resilience. Uh, they have stood up remarkably against the Russians for more than two years now. And I think they were given little chance of doing that at the beginning of the conflict, but they have ex exceeded expectations, um, not just with uh, fighting on the ground, but as you said, uh, the development of new technology, uh, new technology and weaponry um, to bring the fight to the Russians as opposed to just waiting to get punched by the Russians. Now, they're not doing that. Um, so it says a lot about Ukraine as a country. Uh, it says a lot about their resilience. It says a lot about their um, their their determination to prevail. Um, that said, I, I, I don't think that they're going to change the dynamic uh, with on the ground. Um, because the Russians are, they're, they're, they're essentially taking ground or they have ground um, where the population that they, that they occupy, as it were, are Russian speaking, Russian culture, Russian religion. Um, the people themselves are not particularly uh, anxious to be Ukrainians, um, just like the people in Ukraine are not anxious to be Russians. And so I think that the, the, the Dnieper River uh, pretty much shows that there's a there's a balance to this on the ground that is unlikely to be changed in the near future, no matter how much military force is applied to it, because now the, the, the line, the lines between Russia and Ukraine are hugely dug in um, and, and neither side is going to be making much progress. Uh, as long as that is the case. I think what will be the case is that uh, Ukrainians will develop, continue to develop uh, ways to attack the Russians that uh, surprise everybody because of their technological uh, strength and their determination to win. And with that, I want to thank you for most engrossing and informative discussion in this eighth SITREP that we have been conducting since November in Gaza. And what we have seen is the metastasizing of radical Islamic warfare against Western civilization and even US regional interests during the course of the past six months. And for that, we appreciate your commentary, General, and we hope to see more. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. May God bless Israel. Absolutely. I'm Yisrael Chai. I'm Israel Chai.